Hello. 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 How are you doing? Hello. Is this Michael Reed? Would you please uh, put, hey, who, who are you? Would you please put on Michael Reed? <laughs> yeah, well, this is what Michael Reed looks like now. <laughs> Used to look a lot younger when I was active. <laughs> oh, yeah. A lot more I, active, let's say. Do you prefer Michael Reed or do you prefer Mr. Michael Reed? You, you call me Mr. Tibbs. No, yes. Um, no, it's uh, Mike. Just call me Mike. Mike is good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, Jeff and Dave here in it. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you all too. Welcome to the Two Half Squads podcast. We are we're we're going to take an hour of your life. You're never going to get it back. <laughs> yeah. Just another regret to, to yeah. have. Yeah. <laughs> Amongst the sea of them. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, well, so, first up, we are in the Palatine Arlington Heights area, and Mike, you are over in Geneva, Illinois, on the Fox River. That is correct, right? That is correct. I've been living here for about 15 years. Um, you know, prior to that, I was in Cincinnati for about three or four. Well, when I wasn't on in Iraq and uh, other other fun places like Nigeria, uh, and then um, I, prior to that, I was in Kansas City, um, which you probably would know from the original March Madness tournaments, and before that, Los Angeles, um, which is where um, you know that my Probably got my start in ASL and, um, you know, taught by uh, one of the masters himself, uh, the late Cloyd Angel. And then um, hooked up with uh, Mark Newcomb and John Knowles and worked uh, with them on the kinetic energy time on target stuff. Well, we got to hear about that history, but I have to interject right here as an interesting synchronicity. I was born in Kansas City and I spent uh middle school in cincinnati oh wow <laughs> so how about that and i i visited cincinnati and i'm planning to die in kansas city <laughs> and you know <laughs> how to spell to date there so you're good you know how to spell california so there we yeah. go that completes the circle yeah i was i was actually born in philly move <laughs> my family moved out there during the um during the aerospace boom in the late 60s. Ah, interesting. So, so about was, five years old is when I went out to California. So essentially, I raised Californian. But Pennsylvania Dutch roots going pretty far back. Okay. And uh, it's in California that you got involved in ASL and probably gaming in general. You want Could you give us a little history of that? Well, sure. I mean, yeah. If I go back, uh, my very first war game... Um, about my 10th birthday and, uh, I actually got it in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania at the, at the mall. My grandmother bought me a copy of Midway <laughs> and, um, that was my first, first war game. And after that, you know, I probably did the line that everybody else did with a lot of the Avalon Hill games, got involved with, um, Russian campaign, Anzio, um, submarine, air assault on Crete things like that, and then this funky little game called Squad Leader when it came out. I didn't get a purple box. I think I got one of the first orange boxes after the, <laughs> that came out. I remember buying it at Toys R Us. Yep. <laughs> so, who, who were you playing these games with in those days? Um, high school friends. Oh, okay. And um, so I was the, you know, and then through school, we basically took over the simulations club that there was there in our school. Huh. And then being a bunch of adolescent, pu adolescent punks, we renamed it the Simulations and Miniatures Club so we could call it the S&M Club. <laughs> <laughs> we were 14, 15 years old. What do you expect? <laughs> and, That's exactly and, what you expect, yeah. And uh, we, uh, we were able to get the home ec teacher allowed us to use some of those big tables, you know, that they would, they would use for sewing classes and like that. And we, we got to play in there during lunch periods. <laughs> so we, we ran the gamut, you know, between, we played a lot of multiplayer games, a lot of diplomacy, Kingmaker, Circus Maximus. Mm. Um, let's see the old card mm. game, nuclear war. I mean, mm. and we had a running, we had a running battle and feud going on with the environmental club because of the, the announcements that we would put in our 
bulletins of like nuclear weapons testing today and you know c2 and they would come in and protest us and then uh, <laughs> next week we had you know horse horse flesh flaying and you know, for uh, for circus maximus um then dune came out and we got really big on dune. that oh, yeah. yeah and so um yeah it was it was fun and so i you know met a lot of a lot of friends i still have a few of them uh, left over i think uh, you know it's um you, whichever ones i'm in touch with still from the the those way back which is now 40 years ago 40 45 years ago somewhere in there yeah. <laughs> and um so went off to college and i went to uh, i went to west point so i up from California and up to upstate New York and upstate New York in this case being just 50 miles north of New York City and um, when I was at West Point obviously part of the job is to learn all the military stuff but then there was a very healthy wargaming group there yeah, I'll bet. yeah they had war games committee um, and I got involved with that and in that time frame, they had actually an active wargaming league amongst some civilian and and uh, well, they, all, they were all civilian uh, colleges and like just local New Jersey, New York, Connecticut area wargamers. Mm. So we'd alternate being able to host some of these events and these competitions, you know, and, and you'd play the games that were in there. Um, Fast attack boats, the old Yakinto game, um, NATO. Um, let's see what else. Um, oh, uh, Victory in the Pacific. So, you know, and then that's also where I was introduced to a lot of um, a lot of the um, SPI games because I had not really seen them out there. Mm. So, learn you know, Nay versus Wellington. We had copies of. Uh, Wellington's victory of which I do have one of those copies here. I wasn't able to abscond with the uh, campaign for North Africa's, but I think that was a blessing in disguise. Uh, but we used to be able to go down on leave sometime to the complete strategist in New York City. It's on 33rd Street right near the uh, right near the Empire State Building. And we bought this neat game from Australian design company called Empires in Arms. So that okay. Napoleonic Wars, strategic level, and I almost flunked out of college playing that game. <laughs> 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 it's yeah, it's it's why I finished half you know five hundred out of a thousand in my class rather than uh, much higher. So, so then, so then you graduated out of West Point. Yes, and then. So, and I was I was I was commissioned in the uh, infantry, and um, spent a year down at um, Fort Benning, going through officer officer basic, ranger school, uh, Bradley fighting vehicle school, and then mortar platoon leader school. So if wow. you ever seen my handle on like game squad like that, Fort Deuce MF, that stems from my time later on as a mortar platoon leader. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Um, and you know, so I, you know, I was, I've been involved. I mean, I could fill up a whole interesting story about, uh, running the point cons at West Point, uh, in 85 and 86, where we actually invited almost everybody who was anybody in the hobby to come free as a, you know, because we couldn't charge for the venue. We had a large ballroom and we invited Avalon Hill, the SPI people with good victory games, Rafam, Ralpartha, Lou Zaki, you know, and almost every one of them came. Wow. So we had, we had um, <laughs> Tom Shaw showed up with Jack Dot. <laughs> and, they, you know, and they wanted basically, you know, Tom Shaw was an avid uh, racquetball guy. And so he wanted to play racquetball in the West Point gym. <laughs> so I set it up for him, him to play there. Um, Mark Herman, Richard Berg, uh, Craig Taylor, Luzaki showed up and played the saw at a dining in for us. Uh, so it was really neat that we got to see you know, all this. And this is right around 85. This is a little bit after Beyond Valor had come out. But something that very few people know is the 
debut for Streets of Fire was actually at our point con in 85. Oh, okay. That Tom Shaw brought up brought up a handful of copies. <laughs> and debuted and we sold you know sold them. So I had got one of those original copies of that was sell, sold out there of the wow. brand new Dazzle. Um sad to say for me because I was involved in you know more than just squad leader i never locked on to advanced squad leader as a cadet or even as you know when i was a lieutenant over over in uh, west germany it was after i came back in uh 1990 and i was living back again in um, in redondo beach el segundo area of california and there was an old club there called the random war gamers that met at the TRW building that was just south of the uh, Los Angeles airport. Uh, TR, it's now Northrop, but TRW, if you've ever seen the movie The Falcon and the Snowman, uh, wow. the Timothy Hutton character was one, he was, he was the one stealing secrets from there. Uh, okay. <laughs> so they're a government contract, but we, we were allowed there and there was a group of avid squad leader players that we're always in the one corner, and did, did, did either of you know Cloyd Angel? No, no. Uh, big, tall fellow, flat top, booming voice, and he would be sitting over there, and I would hear rally phase, you know, repair, recover, rally, as he's walk, as he's stating his way through these things, and uh, and teaching that he was playing. Uh, Dan Plakta is a fellow I, I think is still somewhat playing in, in squad leader now and then a few other uh players that probably aren't but uh i decided one time i said you know i've had this game sitting here for all this time i really want to finally learn it because i, I played squad leader i played cross of iron i gave up this crescendo of doom and gi even though i bought them <laughs> and so him and mark and john put me through the paces and I think my first s scenario that I ever played against a live opponent was actually against Mark Newcomb. I played Devil's Hill from the old tournament one. Yeah. And then I played a, a three-way scenario. It was still a two, yeah, of uh, the Cossacks are coming, where I had the group in the middle, and uh, Cloyd took one side, and Mark took the other side, and they just proceeded to wipe me out. <laughs> but... The nice thing was, as I was being wiped out, they were explaining how and why they were wiping me out. <laughs> so that was the kindling of, well, sorry, kindling's NA now, but uh, that's the kindling of my, <laughs> of my <laughs> ASL, um, you know, career. That, 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 I don't recognize 90% of the names you dropped, but oh. I can hear Jaws dropping already when we, when we post this show. I'm gonna. I can tell that Jaws will be dropping. Yeah, Jeff doesn't go as back as far as I do, so I yeah you know, went they, up into my <laughs> box that is not on my ASL shelf here because in my apartment I put in a giant plastic box um, all my third party products that were these mm -hmm. newsletters and things. So I've got the Fire for Effects in there, the route reports, and these time on target things. And I have a very fascinating letter from Mark Newcomb. And oh. Apparently, I, I wrote him a letter. I still have this thing, 1995. Look at his letterhead. Wonderful. Um, nice. And he says, thanks for taking the time to write, January 1995. He said, I'm sorry <laughs> you didn't like the bayonet charge, marching fire, special scenario rules. Until your letter arrived, the consensus had been unanimously in favor of the availability of such a universal scenario special rule. I understand your trepidation concerning more rules to remember. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeff, this one of Jeff and Ryan's tropes on the show is this is more rules to remember. So it's funny that I actually wrote huh. that in 95 because now I, I love the bayonet rules. And I didn't even know that I wrote this letter till I went and dug <laughs> all this stuff out upstairs. Oh, that's that's interesting. I've signed actually... for Mark Newcomb. I I kept the thing, you know. Is that a sign of a fanatic or something? Money. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've I've got uh, I've got one of them signatures too. See. <laughs> so, so, 
were they your first then like connection with the the publishing aspect? And... Yeah. Other other than having worked with um, you know at, at at West Point doing a little bit of the convention running, um, that was my first really with uh, publishing on the on the board gaming world. I uh, I, I did at West Point meet a fellow who's very prolific on the miniature side of the world, uh, Buck Serdu. He's written a lot of miniatures rules and lines of that. Just, you know, he, he stayed in the service. Uh, I think while well, went all the way up into Colonel was, was doing uh, computer, cyber, cyber, things like that. And when I had gotten out of the service before I got back into ASL, I uh, was involved in uh, Ancients, the w, old WRG seventh edition. WRG seventh edition, yeah. That's and my I first minute. and I became I became the Southwest Group's um, leader, and we held tournaments there at the TRW and a few other places. And then, for a brief period of time, I was uh, trying to remember whether it was secretary or VP. I think it was VP of the North American Society of Ancient Med Medieval Wargamers. <laughs> so. It seems whenever I got into something, I just dumped, jumped in deep, oh, you know, like there. And so WRG was was tailing off because the you know, DBM, uh, e easy to play rules had come out. Yeah. It had splintered the hobby between that and Tactica and a few other things. And that was also the time that I started getting into ASL. So that period of my life was closed for a while. Yeah. And um, then I jumped whole hog into ASL, uh, played in some of the tournaments um, at, um, you know, Los Angeles. And what was really unique about the way they ran the Los Angeles tournaments were a different group of people would run the tournament each, each time. And there were three, um, there were three conventions in the L.A. airport area a year. Uh, Orcon, Game X, and Gent, and um, Game I I forget, Game X. It was something else. <laughs> but there are three different, and they they would meet there, and the ASL club would meet up and play. But whoever was running it had the responsibility to create and test and spring the scenarios on everybody blind. Oh, hmm. so um, from that. You actually have a genesis of a few more well-known uh, things actually showed up because you know you had Mark and John had created some of those scenarios. Uh, the Tiger Two Two Two, for example, was one of those tournament scenarios that came out of there, as were a handful of few others. Um, and then Eddie Zeman and Steve Deflison also were running stuff. Uh, Eddie so and some of the some of the um, heat of early heat of battle stuff had actually had its genesis of those tournaments. And then probably, yeah, <laughs> you got some. I, 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 unfortunately, I left it in my room unless it's hiding back here, but one of those tournament scenarios was called uh, Grounding Noriega. Yes, I never played that one. That, it came with, part. like, special forces, little counters. Right, they um, were 4 eights or 4-2-9s, um, you know, SEAL teams, right. Yeah, and Jeff knows I, I play like everything and I mark it all off and I and yeah. so I had this thing and I would kept going, well, it it seems a little different, but I'm gonna try this sometime. And then yeah. all the new stuff keeps coming out and I never have gone back and played so that one. That that was Mark's foray into modern ASL, you know, because modern you had night ASL. sites. I mean, talk about this is a tournament and nobody complained about it. Oh, because we played it there at a tournament. We played it at the tournament as a round of the tournament, and it was a night scenario with new yeah. counters and new rules. And and I don't know, maybe <laughs> Californians were a little more laid back out there. It's, but they were, you know, it was fun to size up a scenario and play. It. You know, from mm -hmm. time to time, you might end up something that was a little bit of a dog balance wise, but more often than not. And remember, we're talking back in 1990, 91, 92, you know, in that time frame, there wasn't a ton of scenarios out. Right. Uh, so unless you want to just have the old rehash, once again, a guard's counterattack or something, you know, you were going to, you know, you wanted to play these things because they were cutting edge. <clears throat> so 
you know, and then then you start seeing people would bring things like God Save the King, and then th um, the Tarawa, um, and then the time on targets, and you know, before he was seduced by the dark side, uh, the critical guy, um, I forget his name. Um, <laughs> the uh, so th those kind of things were what we chomped the, chomped at the bit for. So that was the tournament you know, up, upbringing that I had. And they had great players in there. I mean, the aforementioned Cloyd, he was, he was probably the strongest person I ever saw that could pick up, you know, just pick up a, um, you know, you hand something right in front of him, like, this is the, this is the scenario, right? And he would literally be able to size it up, come up with some sort of action, set up and get ready to kick your ass in about, you know, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, boy, it's funny. Yeah. I still, I still say after, playing over a thousand games it's funny how i can look at a board right away and some of them yeah i, I just sit there and go i don't know what to do so yeah. <laughs> just do the usual then you know well I've, on my table over there i've got bloody red beach uh maps set up for they've been set up for the last two weeks i'm still trying to figure out how to set the dang thing up <laughs> as a defender you got yeah yeah and so I'm trying to figure out how in the heck am I supposed to kill Marines in the water when anything that tries to shoot at them is going to get wasted by air. But um, <laughs> that's uh, well, we'll see. Uh, but that was, you know, that was the fun of, of those tournaments in there. So life and work wise, you know, I, I got into the time on target when uh, it was published, you know, at the end of December 94. I mean, yeah. yeah. Battle of the Bulge 50th. We just had the, what, 70th or 75th? Yeah. 75th a couple years ago. So that's over 25 years old. <laughs> and I think when that was when that was published originally, uh, you know, I only had one kid. <laughs> and I, some of the stuff that I did was too late to show up there. Uh -huh. um, it looks like mostly Mark was all on it's this. Mark yeah. and John. Mark okay. and John Holmes. Okay. And so around that time, I got a job offer to move me. Yep, there we go. And this is where my my story with uh, Time on Target really starts to take off. Excuse me, just for one second. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I put all my scenarios into this one. So... This book, no triumphant procession, is a lot of the genesis of what you see in that saw seed, which you saw in that uh, in that uh, time on target. Yeah, John Russell basically had a really nice um, in-depth analysis of those battles that were happening on that left flank. You know, in April '45. So you have the. Uh, you have some Ash and Trash, uh, Hitler Jugend SS, and you have uh, Kriegsmarine fighting his infantry, and then you've got a lot of Brits who just don't want to be the last ones to die in the war. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, special rules for the Mar German Marines. Yep. And I guess was this the first hasty uh, roadblocks ever? These ever were the first made? hasty roadblocks. Yes. Um, so. The bayonet charges, marching fire, supplemental armor, that came in the first set. In fact, but for the most part, most of bayonet charges weren't, I mean, not bayonet charges, but supplemental armor was just an esoteric thing thrown on. And um, the first thing that really gets used, though, is the unit replacement there, which is pretty much you know showing how SS break down into junk. Yeah. By like failing like the LR. 436. And then the uh, special parts of the 548s go into the 447 to the 436 for the Marines. Yeah. And then the hasty roadblock, which is one of my favorite uh, rules, is being able to basically have a roadblock that you can clear easier and possibly create, has, instead of a wall, it's a hedge um, TEM. And it's easier to clear by driving a vehicle in and try to pushing it out of the way. So you know, picture a bunch of people... Whereas the Sarge would call us to make yourself an abatee by uh, putting some C4 on a, on a on a tree and felling the tree. Yeah. <clears throat> that's that's the kind of thing there. And 
what's neat is in this book there i mean he he basically shows some of these uh, hasty roadblocks i'm not, not going to dig it up here yeah but, but log this this just came out from the same author this this year which one is it it's blurry well, there's the strife oh back it up oh yeah that, that's okay. That, 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 okay okay yeah. and it shows about 25 30 years more research and you can see it's a lot thicker and line there which is file that away for when we talk about where we're going in the future here <laughs> so that's what we so like to with, hear too yeah with this yeah with this um for example my one of my first published uh scenarios which was a night scenario lee bell pull it back by pull it back, oh, by your pull it back or Think, push it up or up yeah, I'm not sure. It's, yeah, it's not coming in. Maybe if it's next to your face. There. Mm, Still I don't know why, but anyway, yeah, which one is it? it. Yeah. Which one is this? Go ahead. Uh, Tot 19, Liba Elfrida. Tot 19. It's a it's a night it's a night scenario, um, basically where you have a German strong point out in a farm field, and the. Uh, the, the Brits are trying to attack to basically knock out the... Yeah, there you go. It's that one there. And it could be a little better balanced. I think it's a little uh, anti, um, anti towards the Brits. And probably want to discuss some things here about scenario design philosophy. Because there were two things that, you know, Tot always gets dinged about. <laughs> One was lengthy SSRs, and yes. the other was complicated victory conditions. And which that was back in 1995 and then 97, right? But if you would look at a lot of the stuff that's come out in action packs and other design like that nowadays, it would fall right in line with, with, with normal. Mm. So a lot of the SSRs were lengthy because we you know, we're not a big company that'd be publishing errata all the time. You tried to make sure they were spelled out clear enough Clearly. that there was not any, you know, any, you know, ambiguities. Yeah. yeah. You know, a little over, you know, it, to me, philosophical, if I'm going to sit down and play a th two or three hour game, I can spend five minutes reading, a, reading an SSR. Yeah. Right. And the SSRs for the whole package, if I've got 17 scenarios that are all based on there, that's nothing more than what you're doing with a historical. Um, you have, you know, the KGP SSRs or the Red Barricades SSRs. Right. 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 If you reuse them, then you the the uh, capital expended to learn them the first time is not there. But in the victory conditions, the things that help, you know, helped um, set. I thought set it apart was these casualty victory caps. And a lot of times people would lose the scenario because they went over their CVP cap. Well, there's a reason for that. And in, in, in this one particular one, these CVP caps were typically hard on the Brits. And because the why? The Brits were trying to win without being the last man to die. You know, this wasn't a go for broke. We already knew we were going to win the war yeah, by this time. April 1945. Yeah. Right. So this is the one where... Now we want to win the war without losing many more. I mean, you know, Britain had been at war for six years already, you know, and had, had taken some horrendous casualties early on, some more horrendous casualties due to some real bumble-headed operations. Thank you, Monty, for Market Garden. And then, um, you know, they, they just add to that that they lost a complete generation in the 1914 to 1918, mm -hmm. right? from a smaller country itself. Of course, you're going to be casually conscious. Us in the United States, we're very casually conscious, right? You you know, you could say less so, and, you know, if you take a look, we don't have too many casualty victory point caps for the Japanese or the Russians. Mm -hmm. well, there's a reason. It didn't seem to be that, you know, that part. So what it's trying to do is teach you to husband your forces and not take silly, silly um, efforts there. It takes a different mindset to play that, and it and I submit it takes a different mindset to play a Brit than it does to play a Soviet, to play a Japanese, and if we get into Korea eventually, 
it takes a lot different mindset to play the Chinese properly. But played properly, they are probably my favorite <laughs> um, nationality right now. The communist Chinese that came out, you know, came out with the Korea. Um, two very, well, let's just say, dis highly discussed by some very opinionated people with websites um, responses. <laughs> Hi, Mark. I love you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. it, you're safe here. He doesn't listen. <laughs> Oh, yes, there you go. And so, yeah, so this, if you want to want to know even in more exhausting detail what I thought way back in uh, when I started on, that was one of the articles that was in the in the magazine. Uh, yeah. That sounds to, really, really interesting. It's a shame that that magazine is not well, popularly available. I'm sure well, Dave would be willing to part with his copy for five or six hundred dollars. I'll tell you maybe, what. You could talk to me, maybe. <laughs> tell you, all right. Well. We could skip forward and can skip past all the stuff we did with the, the uh, time on target three with our German rare vehicles and the yeah rare vehicle packs. You know, we, we basically poured our heart into this. It's a lot but of I, stuff. And you wrote the whole intro here. Yeah. I don't think you're in that picture. No, that's Fritz Tischy in the middle. Those are three of our crack play testers from Austria. Ah. So I think I last met Fritz sometime in the... I think it was the 90s. Uh, picked, he picked me up at a train at the airport in uh, Vienna and dropped me off at the uh, at the uh, history museum. I was there on a business business trip, and so, so but Fritz and his crew put these things through their t through their paces. Probably a group, the best, one of the best um, playtest crews I ever had. Yeah, and you guys were the first to come out with the um, the, the full demolition yes. demolition charge. Yeah. Yeah, complete, Audible. complete with its own um, player aid, and uh, yeah. it is a fun thing to learn. Uh, so if you, you oh, know, I love the, I remember these, man. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you can't play, you know, you can't say you play with caves or pongees or all this, uh, you know, desert or anything like that, and then say that this one scares you away. And once yeah. again, the rules are complete in the fact that we try to cover everything, which is why, you know. The rules get to that length. You want you want to make sure all the definition is in there, right? So they can, you know, so they when they ask a question, they probably can find the answer in the rules. Because the other thing to remember is this is back in 1997, 98, mm -hmm. right? 96 for this that year. internet was not very big. I mean, uh, I will give a huge shout out now. I don't know if he's even around anymore. Bahadir Arimli. Um, he was he had a job at Caltech and had a Caltech um, account, which Caltech was big in the early days of the internet. And he set up a website for us with a for free, labor of love for him, you know. And wow. and um, you know I lost touch with him over the years, but I did make sure that when uh, Korea was printed, that there is a UN leader counter of a Sergeant Arimli, because one of the things was, is his grandfather was in the Turkish brigade that went over to Korea. <laughs> so wow. hopefully, Bob, dear, if you're out there and you don't have far, forgotten war, if you do get it, there's a, there is a counter in there. In fact, uh, Bob, dear, if you're out there and still playing ASL, contact me. I, I, I can give you one. Of, I can give you a copy. It nice. would be the least... So, so the least I could do, considering that how he helped us, you know, gratis, right on with with a website at a time that neither Mark or I were web savvy, and frankly, most of the world wasn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then in this supplement, I so I think I have all the special rules for the vehicles. There were vehicle notes and everything for right. some German vehicles, and then most of those were all put into the um, ASL by now. And did they're did actually them, not. They're not yet. Okay. So if you would go through this, and so a few are right, like the Sturm Tiger, right. but you don't have rights to those. So MMP could oh. just do their own interpretation of it, right? Yeah, I mean well, there were this many. <laughs> yeah, I got them right. somewhere. Yeah, I got and them. of that, I'm looking. You know, some of them, the Neubau Fartzoig was never never put in. That was the uh, the early model that was sent up to. There was like three copies that were sent up to Norway. So you figure if we've got you know one one counter for each. 
finished tank that was in the war. We could probably put the one, the three counters in for the uh, Neubau Fahrzeug. Uh, there was some French conversions. My, fa my favorite uh, French conversion was the uh, one that actually I designed a scenario around Ring of Fire mm. that was in um, um, Oosterbeek perimeter. It was so it, they took the 75 off and they replaced it with a flamethrower. So you still had the 47, but the flamethrower uh, was was in there and they used there. I think the other items I'm looking at here were T-34s, Porsche turreted King Tigers, the Sturm Tiger, the Diana, which was a uh, half track with a Russian 76 on it. Um, the variant of the uh, Panzer... Um, Panzer IV slash 70A with a lot heavier upper armor. Those Funk links that you mentioned, the RSO tractors, and some uh, French panhards. So, and what we tried to do is have a scenario for as many of those as possible within the group. So, uh, hold that thought. I'll get back to that one again, too, at the end. <laughs> um, let's see. From that, we went to, um, you know, March Madness tournament. So we were still doing, oh, sorry, I need one, one more thing that's in between there. That magazine is famous for the first widely acclaimed three-player scenario, Dogs of War. Dogs of War, yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got some surprises I'll show you that can combine with that later on. After that, we went to uh, March Madness. So, as I told you, I'm more I liked organizing tournaments and organizing get-togethers. So when I got to Kansas City, uh, I met a couple of local guys. Uh, one really great fellow, um, Larry Maxwell, and I don't know whether he's even in the game anymore. But um, you know, and so he became he was also in Olathe when I was in Olathe, and um, he became my regular gaming partner. And, uh, you know, I, I met a few of the other guys in there. That's uh, Paul Works is interesting, moved to the Kansas City area a couple of years after I moved to the Kansas City area because he had been I had, I had met him in the in the Los Angeles area because he worked up at China Lake, the, the Naval Weapons Station as a war gamer for the for the Navy. Well, he got a job now, and he's, I guess, been doing it for the last 30, 25 years or so, and he does war games for uh, Leavenworth. Not the prison, the uh, combined arms school. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, as luck would have it, after I moved out of Kansas City, a bunch of more Kansas City ASLers moved in. Uh, but I, I started the March Madness scenarios, and this was a way, and Mark, Mark helped me out that he has a whole bunch or he had a whole bunch of unpublished designs and so did I and so did a few of our friends that we figured maybe we should uh, put together a scenario pack and host the scenario host the tournament around it so that was the that was the genesis of the March Madness scenario packs um, that and so in 1996 we had the first March Madness, but that one was a little too early, so we just did the old-fashioned, okay, here's a scenario list. We had a dozen people show up, mostly local, maybe from a state or two apart, and uh, that was that. In 97, though, we, gave, we said we'd give away the March Madness scenario pack, which uh, you probably have a copy of there or not. No, I was not into the March Madness. We just received okay. the stuff from the Kansas City guys. Just sent us a bunch oh. to review on yeah. the show and start oh, to play through. Yeah, that's that's actually well. I'll get to that at the end of this March Madness. Yeah, because so, this was this was not that. No, no the the tournament name. Um, you know, I I coined it because we were doing it right around the time of uh, of the actual March Madness, and um, yeah. I, I ran it for from 96 through 2001. And then when I got shipped over to Kansas City or from Kansas City to Cincinnati, it went fallow. And about six or seven years later, Paul, who had been, you know, my right hand man on, on the last two years that we, the two of us had designed all the scenarios of those, 
um, asked whether these guys could resurrect it and use the name. I said, by all means. Oh, okay. That's so, all right. Cool. <laughs> and they've, they've gone on to bigger and better things since then. That's, I mean, so the only thing that I have left in, in that one was the original name. <laughs> okay. But, but so in this, in this scenario pack, there was 12 scenarios and one, which was sort of cool is called the dreadnought or Rosinia, which was a multi-part scenario where the Russians have one counter, or technically two, a KV-2 with a uh, with a 9-2 armor leader. And then in, in four different parts played on this board, the, the uh, Germans are coming in with ash and trash trying to knock out this single KV-2. Cool. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a four-part scenario, four or five turns apiece. The third, you know, the third part of it's at night even. But you can literally play this twice, you know, twice in about four or five hours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a fun little scenario. Um, we also resurrected um, Beyond the Pack Fronts, the original first uh, Aslug scenario. And did a lot of play testing to get rid of a, some gaminess in the original version. And also to make the SSR or the victory sound, victory conditions a little more understandable. Um, folks debate whether we did that right or not. <laughs> um, my absolute favorite scenario, um, which I commissioned Mark to do because I was so sick and tired of the Michael Whitman worship, is Aces Over Eights, and it's the death of Michael Whitman scenario. Oh. <laughs> okay. So this is the action in taking the version of the action where the fireflies, and you know, get knock him out. So it's a it's a tigers versus fireflies and Shermans and some can, uh, priest kangaroo born infantry. So it's 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 a nice little scenario. Um, then a couple of my designs were like angels at the airfield, which was uh, out of the old Eleventh Airborne uh, book, with uh, General Swing, the actual division commander, going down to headquarters and to his artillery, and they literally lining people up left and right like an old Civil War assault trying to push the Japanese off the airstrip. So, and then my first ever design scenario, Lieutenant Almost Fire, which which would have made it in the bulge packet had it had it happened at that time. Oh, okay. So, <clears throat> so then the Korea, so that okay. idea was started with you guys and Kinetic right. Energy? Right, Kinetic Energy, and we had the Korea scenarios. And um, so the Korea... The Korean War, you know, so we did we did the uh, Allied Allied Romanians and all that, but the Korean War had been sitting around for a while, and um, we we had worked and worked on it to create to make a a, a submission that would go to um, go to Avalon Hill, right around the time that Avalon Hill was taking a nosedive. And just to give you an idea of how long ago it was, we put the board numbers, what we thought it would be, way out in the future. So here's like board 61, right? <laughs> and board 62, <laughs> et cetera, you know. Some of this stuff might look a little familiar, but it's uh -huh. not the exact same. Um, it, so we went all the way up to board 66 of this. Okay. Yeah, because it had the, the long mountain there on the good? side. It had the long hill on the side. Half yeah, the hill. so basically you still had that. This is probably one of my favorite boards right here. And so if you catch those switchbacks here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah but if you notice, you know, that um, instead of uh, a steep hill SSR, what we tr decided to use was uh, slopes since they were already in and tested in ASL. Oh, okay. So that was one of the hurdles that we were trying to fight with uh, getting a pre- a, approval for was the fact of putting slopes in the real system itself. Everybody's afraid of slopes until they play with it, and then they like, why aren't we playing with it all the time? <laughs> you know, it gets rid of that cupcake hill syndrome. Yeah. And so these are these are recent vintage printings of the of the original stuff. And we had a complete um Let's see here. We had a complete um, rule set built out, mostly you know, definitely fleshed out through the, and we were looking to put it into two modules: one that would have been the North Koreans and the South Koreans and the U, uh, U.S. 
then the second one would bring in the UN and the Chinese. Wow. So, so this was in an advanced state. Yes. I mean, we had, uh, there was a chapter H, there was, um, uh, the boards, there were the counters and there was a ton of scenarios, um, that were built in this. So, um, you know, let's bring these up here. You can see some scenarios of that. And I don't know if you ever seen stuff from Mark Newcomb. His his rough drafts look better than some people's full copies. <laughs> okay, so uh, so that was all created. We put an initial submission in. Um, it got sent to. Um, by that time, um, MMP had taken over the um, care and feeding of ASL on 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 uh, Avalon Hill's behalf. There were, let's just say, in one in one end, some philosophical differences. Um, and long story short, between the crash of AF, of uh, Avalon Hill and um, not time to work out those philosophical differences, along with a complete shift of Avalon Hill from being pro hobby press to anti hobby press, you know. It, if you go in the annual 93B, Rex, you know, Rex Martin mm -hmm. talks about how great a hobby press is that you know creates additional content and all that and calls us to arms. Oh, right. And then, then they turned, basically you know, then he's that was when the copyright issue the copyright issue stuff all yep. started then, right? Yeah. They tried to shut down or everyone had to change their counter art and all that kind of thing, right? Yeah, it, it, and it, it it got dirtier than that. It not really dirty to us though. But we were collateral damage in the main charge. How's it say on that? Yeah, okay. Um, and so one thing had another, and yeah, so this is 98, 99. Because I, I remember actually playing an ASL Korea scenario with Klaus Malmstrom at ASLOC in 1998 or 97, I think it was. Tugak Seesaw, and it was a battle with Chaffees and uh, some tanks that was up, up around that area on the Pusan perimeter. Mm. And um, had a great time of it, but in the end, you know, it, it wasn't going to be. Uh, we had done the 98 um, Allied Romanians, um, you know, pack for the March Madness 98, which is still probably one of the rarest packs out there where the uh, had the counters some chapter h and this is pre armies of oblivion if you recall and um we only gave it out at the tournament to people who went to the tournament we wouldn't even yeah. sell it separately because we didn't want to run afoul of the yeah, you know you, the copyright <clears throat> you should have seen the hate mail i got i swear <laughs> for i want one of those using to sell to people i was there were there was you know some folks and and the bribes were great. I mean, they they were they wanted to like they were wanting to you know go overboard on a lot of this stuff. But you know, we we wanted to not be sued first of all. <laughs> and, so but two, we did, wanted to get the ideas out there. And did this part of this Korea stuff get into the MMP stuff or no? Well, no, no I'll, I'll I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So this was in '99. We republished some of our old scenarios in the Mar in the March Madness '99 pack, sort of like a best of. And we, but we didn't just republish them like some unspoken New York publisher does. Uh, we pulled them back, we replay test them, re retooled them to try to make them better scenarios because they were popular or favorites, but they had balance issues. So we retested them and came out in full color. You know to. To, as part of that package and then on the weekend the weekend of the tournament unannounced we also threw in what we had been working on as a british rare vehicles pack with a couple scenarios and handed those out followed almost immediately by a we are ceasing operations uh, mail lots of reasons behind it burnout was definitely one of them a lot uh, the of work best, uh, uh, the rest really remained personal, you know, it's, um, you know, it was, and, um, so 
it became the long dark winter, I guess, of uh, of my ASL involvement after that point. I, but to to be fair, what I two things I wanted to make sure would still happen. One was that eventually a Korea project would get done, and B <clears throat> that Mark's copyrights would be um, would be um, honored. You know, he didn't want to have anything you know, published or just out on the open market or pirated and have other people gaining money from it, et cetera. So for years, I would basically keep tabs on making sure that people weren't pirating stuff and sending it out, you know, the, um, but when it came to Korea, you know, I've got on a shelf over there. I don't see if you can see way against the wall. There's a, that shelf, those the full bookcase is uh, is Korea books, <laughs> and so I'd done a lot of work on Korea, obviously in the old the old uh, scenarios, but because of worrying about the IP, everything I just showed you there, I literally closed the book on, <laughs> and wanted to start from scratch, but in this. I had some accomplices who actually ended up carrying a lot more water than I did. Paul Works, who I mentioned before, and Ken Katz were the first two on the board. Um, and then Paul, because uh, you know, Paul and I you know, had played so much together and worked, you know, were pretty well matched in play testing. We got Ken, who's a project manager by day, you know, and uh, was also very involved in, you know, he's a gearhead. He likes to he likes to do all the research on vehicles and things like that as well. And also is a hell of a lot more organized than I am. <laughs> um, he became our project manager. I wrote what I believe to be a scoping document of what we should have in a ASL Korea module. And some of those things that were in there eventually made it into the module. For better or for worse, for some people, I'm thinking. Um, you know, some of the things in there, the, the certain nationality characteristics, uh, certain um, the the heat the heat dud penetration penetration dud because of what was happening in the game modeling. You know, Bass 45s were knocking out T34s with just a unreal alacrity, oh. and it had to do with the model that the model that was used for heat penetration die rolls under World War II couldn't transfer forward because it's too it was too lethal. So, you know, how could we account for that? If you if you've never seen the movie Pentagon Wars or Pentagon, I think it's Pentagon, well the one's about the development of the Bradley, mm -hmm. where they where they got these Czechoslovakian made RPG twos and they were shooting against the Bradley's uh, aluminum armor and just bouncing off of it. Well, realistically, they should go through is because of, you know, manufacturing defects or strike angle, things like that, 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 yes, on the spec, you should be able to go through X amount of armor. Well, you only get that in a perfect laboratory setting. You don't get it when you're trying to run on the, on the battlefield. And the more sloped armor you're up against, the worse it is. And that's what the thing is that you have some of the armor factor of a T-34 includes the sloping. But it still was not well enough. I mean, there in many of those books there, you see them talking about literally bouncing round after round after round of bazookas off of the rear of T-34s. Mm. <laughs> you know, to, a, to the point where you'd be more effective throwing the tube at the, at the open hatch <laughs> it's, uh, than actually hitting the, mach hitting the uh, machine with it. Um, let's see what other things sort of made it into there. Um, if you... Um, the Rangers, well, being a Ranger, I <laughs> very much uh, was happy to see an eight morale um, U.S. group. But before that, people worry about like the, the overrated fins of the Korean War ASL module. Re mm -hmm. Recall, they were only ever deployed at company level companies at the most. You're talking ten to twelve squads at the most would ever be in a scenario. So. And they were also typically used in those roles 
that you required the self rallying and the ability to deploy, you know, and that's what that it's so easy scenario is trying to show is, you know, that that snatch and grab type mission going out and back and pulling in, you know, pulling in prisoners. Um, you know, the Royal Marine Commandos fell straight out of that because they were basically the British version of that. Um, what's very interesting to me was in Korea, they had taken all the time to create these Ranger units early on, specialized units for these missions, and then they realized that they were denuding the rest of the line units of their best people. <laughs> so by the time 1951 rolls around under Ridgeway, they actually disband the Ranger units and disseminate them back amongst the divisions with all these experienced NCOs working in, in that line. Huh. And then some, some units decide to create their own. The most famous version of that is the Wolfhound Raiders that you see uh, pop up in, um, in the 25th Infantry Division um, in um, Lake Korea. So the Wolfhound Raiders from the 27th Infantry Regiment, I think it is. Uh, David Hackworth, who wrote the book About Face, and he was a, three, a two-war um, hero. Um, he actually was one of the early, early adopters of the Wolfhound Raiders. So those, those squads can still be used in that role. And so I wrote this document, and then it came time to talk about how are we going to portray the Chinese because just handfuls of 337s or 527s or 628s like that do not depict what you read about of the hordes of oncoming and oncoming and rushing yeah. and you know <clears throat> and just that feeling of being you know bugs mr rico zillions of them which <laughs> have of just that overwhelming and just shooting and shooting and shooting but they just keep on coming so looked at that and said well there's sort of two things here there's the factor sort of like the Japanese of having step reducing that you, you whack a few, but they're still coming to get you. Yeah. Right. And there's so, you know, and that also meant we didn't have to double or tri artificially double or triple the OB to make it work. So the OB matches closer to what you read on OBs in the books. Okay. So, you know, but as the rules giveth, they also need to, take it away because if you let an ASL or use their own imagination on using troops like that, then all of a sudden you get a totally ahistorical usage of them. You basically have all these tons of guys and they just move up and they fire, right? Or they, move, or they, uh, you know, they individually infiltrate and move through and get to the, around the sides and there's no way to stop them. Yeah. We, we didn't want the Japanese repeated. What we wanted was that uniqueness to be done there. So that's why you see a pseudo command control type rule with the the, the, uh, the uh, platoon movement. So the infantry platoon movement. And then the saying, saying if you're going to, going to basically prep fire, if you're not leader directed for prep fire, you're halved. To dis it doesn't eliminate the fact that you can do it, but yeah. it discourages you to do something that's really a against the way that the army's doctrine was yeah. without hamstringing you to do that. So in order to do this, this takes this little, this is the, this is the speed bump that a lot of ASLs are hitting right now is to understand that you can't fight them like you fought the Japanese, the Russians, you know, even the world war two Chinese, you've got to develop the strategy that, gets the most out of what you have within what's given to you. Leadership was uh, we, one leadership was one thing that we were dinged for because we didn't have anything higher than I think a minus one leader, or might have been one or minus two leader. But they got commissar capabilities, the political officers, without shooting them if they if they fail. If they don't fail, yeah, if they fail, right. yeah. And the other thing is they're more they're more interested there for the command and control, being able to do the platoon movement. They're not meant to be there for fire and just this whole the whole um, psychology of the volunteer army and the rank structure is not what you saw in a traditional Western rank rank structure. And what's what surprises me is people were getting on our case for that 
Nobody got on the case of the Finns for having the minus ones. Oh, you know, right, but, right. And that's a bunch, of, bunch of O's, yeah. yeah. It's, and so, all right. Now, are is there a little bit of char- you know, characterization or stereotyping? Yes, but there's that in every nationality characteristic of ASL. That's why we play the game. We know that the Brits don't cower. We know that the Americans will you know, duck their head down, but then when they come back up, they blast the hell out of you, right? And we know the Germans are pretty much balanced across the line. That's, that's And you fight those three armies differently. It's the same thing in Korea. So here in Korea, what you're looking at is learning how to fight with new, you know, with new troops. And even the North Koreans don't just fight like Soviets, even though they're very much Soviet trained. That... You learn how to fight on the train, and you learn how to fight with the fight with the uh, troops. So it's like the PTO all over again. We hope it's not like the desert for people. We hope it gets a little bit more traction than that, and as scenarios are coming out. But I did hop out in the middle of things there. <laughs> Following that that original um, that original um, oh. Um, scoping uh, to use Jerry Maguire's term, right? It was a mission statement. <laughs> As at, after that, Paul and Ken took that and ran with it and actually wrote the rules around that. Okay, because we yeah. did interview Ken in episode 187, yeah. I think. Yeah, so yeah. people can hear that there. Right, so, then so is they it wrote gets... that. I originally had been working a little bit with Don Petros to get some uh, boards done, but then I believe uh, Ken Ken had some boards redone, and those are the ones that end up in the modules. I still got the ones I showed you earlier from Mark, and I got the ones from uh, <laughs> from that around. So maybe someday. And then at that point, I got I got sent on the road a lot. <laughs> Sorry, about 2002, 2003. I was on the road pretty much until uh, COVID hit, frankly. Uh, it's, uh, and I've, I faded further in the back of this. And then a few other people got onto the projects, uh, most notably uh, Pete Dolan and Andy Hershey. Oh, mm-hmm. And so they eagerly helped carry this through. And so in the end, you know, you got the group efforts of five people you know it's 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 kind of sad for me because a lot of my original stuff that i'd done was in the early early days and then you know the the lion's share of the really tedious work was the other guys you know yeah i but i i you know i also maintained a maintained a close relationship with the mmp guys and you know when we would broach something that might be considered a controversial rule rather than write the rule, work it out and make it work and then have them say, no, we can't do this. We basically chatted with Perry and them and figured out, will you, will this fly with you? You know, okay. Will you, you know, so it's, so when it came time to get, get this pushed through, there was a lot less, a lot less massaging to get it to that end point. You still had to go through the the Klaus massaging engine, you know, for that all the rules go through, which is great because I, I don't know anybody besides Perry who probably has that encyclopedic knowledge of the rules that Klaus yeah, does. Yeah, right? indeed. Yeah. And so, so then, as we want to try and wrap yeah. up pretty quick yeah. here, um, is the future something you mentioned about that are plans? Yeah. You're back into so, this. You're going to be producing, or well, you know, so finally. Because because of COVID, and, you know, I taught my son how to play, and and um, we've been you know playing for a lot a while now, and I've been able to That's do excellent. more. You know, he's been playing. He's twenty eight now. He's been playing since he's about fifteen, sixteen. His his first his first ever uh, tournament was about twelve years ago or so back in Champagne, and his first opponent got to be Bob Bendis. Oh, <laughs> he beat Bob. Oh. <laughs> I think Bob Bob was as shocked as everybody else was, but, <laughs> because I think he did on there, and he almost took Jim Taylor to the line too. But uh, the, the kid's probably a smarter, better player than me if he would learn the rules better. <laughs> but he, he's doing a lot more. He's an electrical engineer, so he's. Uh, but he, 
I'm, I'm sure if uh, there was a rematch, Bob would like flay him alive. But <laughs> that was uh, that was uh, a nice story you can always have for him. He he took uh, third place in um, St. Louis um, three years ago at that wow. tournament, though. So makes me a proud papa. So I, I haven't won one since all the way back in Los Angeles. So, <laughs> all right. So let's get back to this. I'm back in playing now. I've been uh, refurbishing my kit, so to speak. And then about a year ago, um, you know, I I had finally gotten back in touch work with Mark, and Mark called me out of the blue and. Uh, let me know that he he wanted to turn over the IP of the kinetic energy stuff. So this is the bombshell part of uh, the uh, to MMP. Okay. So for hopeful potential, you know, retooling and use. Yeah. Yeah. So, they, so that's. They... So I mean, you could take a look, for example, and that's why I showed you this. There's the strife book. Could you imagine an action pack for uh, that had some of the scenarios of time on target too? You know, around that common theme. Yeah. Maybe right. some new stuff with the with the new uh, research available. How about an action pack since uh, Swedish were, uh, since the Swedish have uh, now shown that an action pack can have counters? Why not the German rare vehicles in an action pack? Yep. Exactly. Right? Yeah, um, stuff that I missed on the March Madness packs. March Madness like, '98. So, Armies of Oblivion has been create has been created. So, therefore, you already have the the vehicles and the counters, minus a few tweaks here or there, bringing that into an action pack for the Allied Romanian Bulgarian fight in '44-'45. Uh, some of the stuff that's in the March Ma regular March Madness packs, or even maybe in the Bulge, you could pepper through. In annual scenarios, things like that. Mm -hmm. There are other products that you know working on. This is like a little saga camp mini campaign game about Eric Wood. If you read something about the the bulge, about the uh, the legend of the lieutenant who got cut off behind the lines and created his own uh, partisan force. Huh. Some may be apocryphal, but there is a stone to him in Meyer Road, Belgium. You know, talking about his his actions. Huh. Um, Korean action packs. Korea. Uh, the, a lot of those scenarios could be retrofitted, or even maybe some of the boards could be retro. You know, added in for Korean themed action packs. It's been my long desire to do a uh, Heartbreak Ridge campaign game. Ah, yeah. Um, you know, literally in two periods that. You can use the same terrain early on in the Heartbreak Ridge campaign. It's U.S. versus Korean, North Korean, with the French battalion and some Dutch in support. Later on, after the North Koreans have been ex exacerbated, you know, uh, um, attrited down, they're replaced by Chinese. So you could actually have the two different phases of that campaign. That game. same thing. Yep, all played on that. And yeah. I'm not sure Great. if I could get it past. Perry, but I would I would love to have a one four nine hero counter of Highway. If you ever seen the movie Heartbreak Ridge with uh, Clint Eastwood, which is about Grenada? No, I have not. Jeff he just plays this guy Gunny Highway, and he won the Medal of Honor on Heartbreak Ridge when he was with the Army. Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's it's completely completely uh, fictional, but. <laughs> It'd Why be nice not? to have the counter name with it. Wouldn't be the first yeah. time, yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, hopefully I'm not boring you here. but the Well, we're, we will wrap up. It's a, We try yeah. to get a show about an hour, it's, but it sounds like we've covered about everything yeah. that you've had to share. So that's been an excellent interview yeah. um, with stuff to look forward to, of course. Uh, yeah. It's good to so know. Help me, yeah, help me pester Chaz, help me, help me pester Chaz you know, to, yep. to, see, to see what we can do to... Uh, accelerate this and hopefully i'll be able to uh, work with some folks um let me show you one more neat thing i got some chapter h What's in there? cards oh yeah yeah on the vehicle cards and big blown up scenarios oh oh <laughs> 
to be played on big foam core boards um, that are ha halfway in between um, halfway in between um, dazzle boards and regular. So most importantly, uh, okay. let's pull this one out. The Dogs of War. Oh, yes. That is the board with the graveyard out there. Yeah, and the building there. <laughs> along with... It's the three-player one, Jeff. I think you played... Maybe you played a different one than that one. Yeah, this, this was something, actually, that I got as a present from Mark. Oh. <laughs> as, a, as, like... If I were to, you know, if I were to, if I were to do something really special as like a demi deluxe, you know, so half deluxe. Yeah. If, if you notice, each one of these boards is half is half a board. Yeah, right. So, so you have a half board with the enlarged counters, which works really nice. And so he he built some of these up, and I'll take if I can if there's going to be a real Aslock this year. Yeah, or, and it's not this year, or maybe next year. I'll bring these things, and people can use them and play. That with. would be fun. Yeah, yeah. indeed. So, but you know, the nice part was that um, you know that you know hopefully the long slumber and absence from the hobby of the KE scenarios and access to them is you know is nearing an end. Yeah, I think so. And MMP has been doing some of that, getting a lot of this stuff yeah. uh, back into circulation. Right. I nice, mean, I, so. I you know, I'm hope, hoping that uh, we can get we can get something out because there's a whole generation of ASLers who have never seen oh, our stuff. Exactly right. Yeah, that stuff like Jeff. <laughs> yeah, Not like me. And <laughs> the young people like Jeff. Yeah, and so it you know it, it it'll bring it out to an audience. And what surprised me is that. A lot of the things that were cutting edge back then are still are state of the art today. Yeah. So I'm happy with that, the artwork, and so now it's more going to be a fact of making sure that some of these scenarios still still agree with what the way the rules have evolved oh, in right. the last twenty years. Yeah, we'll play test them. We Maybe roll. some play testing for balance and like that. But you have a large portion of people that that you know, would want to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then be able to uh, maybe release some of these things in um, action packs. Because as you see now, the action pack seems to be one of the cool ways to go through there. I could also see turning the TOT 2 into, it, if not an action pack, maybe a historical study along the yeah. lines of Veritable right. and uh, lines there. So, right. yeah. Like All right, well... It's been yeah. great talking with you, getting to meet one of the legends of the game, and absolutely. Know, thank you for giving us your time. Well, thank thank you. I hope we don't bore the bore the folks to death. Yeah, well, people yeah, was, will love it. It's a, a great mix of the history, background stories, and a look into the how things develop and a look into the future. So yeah. we want to thank you very much, and we will sign thank off. You. And uh, we like to say, uh, "Roll low, everybody," and rally well. But not yep. when you're not playing. when you're playing us. So yeah. all right. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. See y'all. Have a great Bye. one. Bye-bye.